Up next is detecting cryptocurrency mining with eBPF. We've learned a little bit about eBPF today. Uh, we'll continue to learn more. And quick Thank aside, you. there's an eBPF uh, pre-game event tomorrow at the main, uh, main facility. If you haven't signed up for it, you may still be able to. That one I don't know for sure, but feel free to try. And with that, I would like to introduce Tracy Holmes, our next speaker. So give a round of applause to Tracy. Hi. All of my favorite people are in the front row, and they're making me even more nervous while being supportive. You're, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, I have emotional support talk people. You may see Duffy come up, uh, come up front with a Rubik's Cube. You may see Laura dance across the front of the stage. And with Marino, we never know what will happen. <laughs> um, so that's where we're at. But uh, if you are in room one, and hello everyone out there, um, this is Detecting Cryptocurrency Mining with eBPF. I am Tracy B. Holmes. I am a technical community, community advocate at Isovalent. Uh, and You've probably heard of us, so I'll just leave it at that. All right, let's see if the pointer works, because it's a Logitech. Hey, all right, all right. So you see a little cute little B up there? That's Tetra B, and that's literally how I found out about Tetragon. I like the logo. Isn't that horrible? Um, so it started with Tetra B. I had just started. I've only been at Isovalent a few months, and so I was trying to find something that I could start learning about. That was interesting to me. And I've, already, I've always been interested in like security, compliance, policies, that kind of thing. I don't like people coming in my house that shouldn't be in my house. That translates to the tech that I either work with. Um, and so at the time, Tetragon was like literally newly open source as of one month before I started. I was able to have Natalia come on our uh, Echo live stream, which is eBPF and office hours. You can get Echo out of that some kind of way. Just work with me. Um, but this is what I call a discovery talk. So discovery talks are how I make my adult brain learn things. I force myself to learn things by, because I have to, you know, present them to you. I won't let you all down. I'll typically let me down instead. <laughs> so this was the thing that I wanted to learn about. So this is going to be full on notes so I don't get this wrong and none of our engineers get me. All right, here we go. So Tetragon, of course, is an agent. It can run on top of any Linux system. And in case of Kubernetes, it's cloud environment. It's a daemon set. If it's your own bare metal VMs or whatever, that's a container that can mount certain configuration files as volumes. It also uses eBPF to extract security of observability data, and it'll give you runtime enforcement. I'm also going to try to get my Apple Pencil out because, of course, my iPad decided to not let me scroll my notes. So let's see. All right, here we go. Ah, oh, that worked. All right. So there are a lot of layers, all of these nice little blocks um, where Tetragon can extract data from, and it'll pro provide enforcement. So if you start from the low level, you get data access, file access, um, data access in the file access network with a variety of parsers, including the level seven parsers. Um, you also get namespacing or namespace, namespace technology in the kernel. It can be like network, PID, mount, UTC, whatever. Um, but you also get capabilities and privileged access. Then you also have the process, process execution layer, and that's where we, we get all of our syscall and any uh, kernel function activity. All right, I mean this pencil. I think this is my safety pencil. All right, also, very important, Tetragon is transparent. It doesn't require any application or code change, but it's also part of the Cilium family, but it doesn't actually need Cilium in order to run. Remember that. It's, <laughs> it's going to be important later. Um, but also, whew. EBPF in real time. So can you all hear me? I think I just screwed up the mic. Here we go. All right. There we go. It wasn't behind my ear. It was behind my lock. There we go. Tetragon's uh, runtime security enforcement and observability tool. I like observability. It means I'm nosy. Um, but this means that Tetragon applies policy and filtering directly to EBPF in the kernel. If you're talking about flexibility, Tetragon will hook into any function in the Linux kernel and it'll filter on its arguments, return value, associated metadata, pretty much if you want to know if it's going on, you can pr pretty much use Tetragon to find it. Um, but it also allows hooking deep into the kernel, and that's where all the data structures and stuff cannot be, well, you want it to hook into the kernel so the data structure and stuff cannot be manipulated by users and such. So, if you want to know what activity we care about, this lists some of the stuff that we need to monitor. 
Um, so any malicious activity that matters, it does at least probably one of these things. And all of these activities can be corresponded to an event that Tetragon generates. That's a nice little list, but that's what you're probably wanting to be nosy about that you noticed was running in the background that you didn't realize was running in the background, which is kind of where this talk came from, but we'll get back to that again later also. Um, how can you spot it? This is how this can be done, and it can be a, it's been done a variety of ways in the past. So while we're talking about this, I'll give you a few more slides on like how it used to be done and kind of how we're doing it. Um, that list includes trace set comp assume, of course, EVPF. See, all right, Mike guy, we're gonna talk about people with, with long hair next time. I got you. It wasn't, it wasn't behind my ear, I got it. I got it that time, yeah. I'm gonna put on my glasses. Can you all hear me better now? Yes. All right, awesome. This is better, I had no voice at all last week. Progress. All right, so this is the oldest approach. Um, we're at LD Preload. Um, so the oldest approach, you would be able to load a library into an app without awareness or changing that application. And we can essentially inject that library into the application and watch all of the system calls that the application is performing with that library instead of the kernel. So this is called system call proxy or LD preload proxy. And that's great, but it can be bypassed. If the application is statistically, I said that wrong. If the application is statically, there we go. Liz is like, not the right one. Uh, <laughs> link, then the LD preload will have no effect and we lose all kinds of visibility as well as any enforcement. And that means it'll be an ineffective. Um, and it's kind of abandoned from that perspective. Now, syscall checks within the kernel. We can do system call checks or syscall checks when we enter or exit from a syscall at the kernel level. There are well-defined points in the kernel for tracing the entry to and exit from syscall. You can hook into these with ptrace. I mentioned that earlier. Setcom profiles, mentioned that earlier. They get evaluated here, and you can hook into these points with trace points or k probes to run eBPF programs. Um, so much better than LD preload because the application can't be bypassed as easily but it's still vulnerable. So um, this is vulnerable, and Duffy's gonna laugh at me because we just talked about this, to so-called top two uh, attacks, which are time of check or time of use, or in Duffy's case, time of first use. And if you wanna know why I'm saying that, he will give you a very great example and how you're sneaking into a refrigerator before I tell you that you're not supposed to be in the refrigerator. Talk to him about that. Um, the hook point when the solution sees the system call is before the last moment, and that's when the application can change it. So you can see it in the picture. Hook point is at the syscall entry level, and then the syscall handling copies those syscall parameters into the kernel from user space is after the checks. So it is possible that an application shows parameters, innocent file name, that thing you didn't know that was in there. I'd like to open that file. The kernel copies those parameters from the user space, but it's possible for an application to still change it to something else after the checks, hence, he got into the refrigerator before I told him he couldn't. He stole an apple juice and he was gone. Bad Duffy. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to make the check at the right place. Uh, avoid, to avoid being vulnerable to these, talk to, I just like saying that, issues, we need to make the checks later after the kernel copied the parameters at the right place. People on camera, I am looking at these notes because I am known to get my words twisted up and someone will tweet that I told you that you could do something with Tetragon that you could not. All right, back to my speaker notes. Linux security modules. Uh, in fact, there's a well-defined interface, interface for doing this, and that's the LSM API, or Linux security modules. It's relatively old. It allows you to do security checks and enforcement at the right level. Stable, safe place to make checks. Requires additional kernel modules to load, and the infrastructure doesn't always allow that, and it's very static. This is used by App, App Armor and uh, SE Linux to check syscalls against profiles and what behaviors are allowed. For example, which files can be accessed by which programs? BPF LSM. This is better known and better suited. Um, it uses eBPF to make LSM dynamic and is a step forward, and it's almost what we want. Um, these API calls are all in the right place and it's designed to be high performance. You get access to the kernel data structures and they're already pre-populated with useful info that you might need for your security check. But, and here's the but, you need a modern kernel. BPF LSM was only introduced in 5.7 and most of us are not using kernels 
anywhere that new in production? Most of us. I didn't say all of us. Most of us. Um, and you're limited to the hook points that LSM provides. I actually have a link to this in this slide that I probably need to add to my resource slide that I'll add before I give you all access to the slides. But um, if you need new hook points, you got to change the kernel code. And this is where Tetra B, my little B dude, comes, to play, uh, comes into play. So we want the same property in terms of safety, hook points, and security than BPF LSM. But we want to avoid the kernel requirements, any additional hook points that can't be found in LSM. We use kprobe uh, and trace points to hook into that kernel function. At this point, I've heard kprobe so much, I need a tattoo that says kprobe. Um, I have a shared state between BPF programs with BPF maps. And this is the yellow database that you see on, that, on the picture. Uh, this allows multiple eBPF programs to work together, and it also allows kernel filtering, and that's the base of the high performance that you get. Context is everything. I like these diagrams. It has emojis. First of all, context is everything in terms of security, and we need to understand and have as much, if not more, data than possible. The better and more fine-grained the context, so in, the, in this case, security observability events, that we mentioned, the easier it is for a security team to understand the log files, create queries, and do alerting. It's also easy to figure out what's the cause and what's affected. The little apple juice gremlins. <laughs> and this is a slide I threw in to give you an idea of what things look like. Pictures? None? All right, we're going for it. Um, so if we look at the network insides of things, and also, this, you're going to get some of your time back, even though I went over. This is very short. So these are all the events when a network connection happens. We can observe everything starting from DNS, TCP, HTTPS, TLS. And if we go from the top to the bottom, if you could actually see all of those lines, you see that the process started with curl, and it was invoked with the argum, argument of Cilium.io. Um, and you can see that in a DNS re resolution. I promise you it will be better on the slides I give you all. In, these, in this case, we made the request from a Kubernetes pod, so it'll try to resolve a bunch of the Kubernetes services. And in the end, you actually resolve Selenium.io, and you see the IP return. Um, if you want to get more into like finding out where stuff is coming from, try the capture the flag that we did a few months ago and try to interject Tetragon into it and see what happens. You'll find lots of nice, lots of nice little stuff in there. And this is what it looks like if you're preventing sensitive file access. Now, here's where if you've ever gone to one of my talks, Marino, don't tweet this because I know you will. If you've ever gone to one of my talks, <laughs> you'll know my discovery talks attempt. I have attempts. They're very good attempts. Let me tell you what happened this time. When I'm at home, I work on WSL most of the time. If you all saw me downstairs, what was I working on? An M1 Mac. Tetragon didn't like that. So <laughs> if you saw me downstairs, that's what I've been frantically working on, trying to make it work. And it took Duffy to come over and go, pull this up. <laughs> and we finally traced it back to it. The, the image is part of the issue, and ARM support is just not there. That being said, what I will do for you all, in addition to this, because I really do want to make sure I figure this out, in addition to trying to get this to work on M1 some kind of way, even if I have to work with the engineers to get it working. Oh, Lord, that's a commitment that's on camera now. Um, <laughs> the other thing I want to do is actually do a full live stream, um, probably towards the end of November, where if I can get Duffy, like if I bribe him with apple juice, um, we'll go on, on stream and like break down what it looks like. The premise is the same. Tetragon is going to help you. Little B dude is going to go through and block crap that you don't want going in there and help you find stuff and help you enforce crap. Adding the cryptocurrency bit was the, the, the bite. Uh, Natalia, who is not here because I was going to point her out, um, is really good with coming up with ideas around Tetragon, and this one caught my eye because, honestly, I honestly don't really know how miners work that well. Um, I just know that they usually steal the resources that I want for myself. So hopefully you'll see Duffy and I before the end of the month get in and just break That's an agreement from Duffy, by the way. There we go. <laughs> um, but here are the resources that, I'm, that I used. Natalia, my colleague, that helped me come up with this idea. We did an Echo um, News about two, three-ish months ago. Um, 
that has a full demo of Tetragon so you all can see how it works because I don't think a lot of people actually know how Tetragon like natively works. Um, so if you want to check us out, that live stream that Duffy and I will do will be on there. Um, if you want to get started playing around with Tetragon on like an Intel, go for it. Um, that's where you will get your Tetragon set up. And the Pixie blog post, Pixie people are so nice, um, that I was going to use for the miner, they have a really nice write-up on a Monero miner um, that I was going to actually use for this. And so that's what hopefully you'll probably see whenever we get to do the live stream. So that being said, I appreciate you all. If you haven't gotten either of these books, please go get those. They are very interesting reading, the reports are, um, especially the security observability one. Also, hey, four down, got you. Uh, you can get up here and say it if you want to. Uh, the security observability uh, with eBPF one is the same colleague that I just mentioned. Um, it was a, she was co-author of that particular report. It's very interesting. You learn a lot from it. I think it's in my bag in the room, to be completely honest. Um, Liz's book is What is eBPF? If you want to know what eBPF is, that's going to be it. And if you all are going to be in, around KubeCon, I think you can download, is it four? Oh, so tomorrow for Cloud Native eBPF Day, I believe we have four additional chapters um, to download for that particular book, which I need to do myself. Don't think that I get everything free um, to learn more about what I've been trying to talk to you all about. So while you all didn't get a demo, you get a promise from a live stream from me. You all hold me to it. Marina, you can tweet that one because I know you'll hold me to it. And thank you all so much for joining me uh, in my discovery talk. <laughs>